Possible by Credit Union of America. Everything we do, we do for you. Member owned since 1935. Greetings to everyone across the state of Kansas. Welcome to Ask Your Legislator. I'm your host, Bob Beatty. Before we get started, let me explain how the program works. We've invited members of the Kansas State Legislature to our studios here in Wichita and to our State House studio in Topeka to answer your questions. Yes, this program is your chance to ask your elected representatives about the issues you are interested in. How do you do that? No problem. If you want to call and ask a question, just dial the toll-free number 1-877-491-5787. That number will appear on your screen throughout the program. If you want to email a question, you can send an email to ask, A-S-K, at kpts.org. You can email at any time. So if you email us a program when the program is not on the air, we might use the question next week or on a later program. So feel free to email us. I have a number of emails I've received that I'll be using on this show. So let's get those questions in for our guest today via phone at 1-877-491-5787 or email at ask at kpts.org. Before we go further, further, I'd like to make a quick announcement about an upcoming special program. On March 25th, Ask Your Legislator will switch to the federal level, featuring as guests Congressman Todd Tehart and Congresswoman Nancy Boyda. So if you have a question about national political issues for these congressional representatives, you can call in on March 25th or send an email to ask at kpts.org. All right, I'd like to introduce our guests today and thank them for appearing on the show. Here in Wichita, I'm joined by State Representative Steve Hubert and State Representative Tom Sawyer. Thank you both for coming. In our Topeka studio, we are very pleased to have State Senator Karen Brownlee and State Representative Harold Lane. Thanks for being on the program. Uh, before we get into the question and answer period of the program, I'd like to ask each of our guests to introduce themselves, let you, the viewer, know who they represent, and uh, let fill, fill you in a bit on their background. We'll start with State Representative Tom Sawyer. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I am Tom Sawyer. I represent the 95th District, which is kind of the near southwest side of Wichita. It includes Friends University, Newman University, West High, that part of town. I've been in the legislature. I first got elected in 1986. I served 12 years. I stepped out of the legislature, ran for governor, uh, then came back again in, in 1982, uh, and uh, I've been s s serving since then. And I serve, I'm on the uh, House Appropriations Committee. I'm the ranking uh, member of the House Elections and Government Organization Committee, Vice Chair of the House Rules and Organization Committee, and also a member of the Legislative Post Audit Committee and the Joint uh, Tribal Relations Committee. Thank you, Representative Sawyer. And during the program, we'll learn a bit more about uh, what issues uh, those committees uh, deal with. But let's go now to State Representative Steve Hubert. Representative Hubert. Thank you, Bob. I'm Steve Hubert. I'm from Valley Center, and I am from the 90th District, which is uh, most of Northwest Sedgwick County. This is my uh, seventh year in the legislature, uh, former school board member, and I do serve on education. Also, I'm vice chair of Fed and State Affairs and serve on government organizations and elections. All right, let's go to our Topeka studio where we have Representative Harold Lane. Representative Lane, are you with us in Topeka? Yes, Bob, thank you. Uh, could you I'm give here. the viewers a little background about yourself? Sure, I'm a State Representative Harold Lane. I represent the 58th District, which is mostly an urban district of Southeast Topeka. Uh, I was appointed in 2003 uh, to fill in uh, an unexpired term for State Rep Rocky Nichols, and I uh, was reelected in 2004 and in 2006. And I serve on the Appropriations Committee. And I'm also on the, the Local Government Elections Committee and on the Joint Information and Technology. Um, I've also uh, been uh, involved at the, prior to that with the Topeka City Council uh, from 2001 to 2003. So uh, we've, we've been busy in appropriations working on the budget um, right now. And uh, we passed that budget out Friday. And we'll have it on the House floor next week. Thank you very much, Representative Lane. Uh, in the biggest studio, we also have Senator Brownlee. Uh, Senator Brownlee, can you hear us? Or are we still experiencing technical difficulties? He's asking if you can hear. I cannot hear you. Okay, well, we'll. I would be glad to hear the 
same type of introduction that Representative Lane gave. Okay. Senator Brownlee, go My ahead with your introduction. Senator Brownlee, I'm a state senator from okay. Olathe. I represent about half or a little more of Olathe, Gardner, Spring Hill, and Edgerton. It's the 23rd Senate District. And I was first elected in 1996. I am co-chair of the Senate Commerce Committee. I serve on financial institutions and insurance yeah, I, I and on federal and state affairs and some joint committees. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the first question that we have for our panel of legislators is a couple weeks ago, uh, the leaders of the, the Senate and the House from both parties uh, gave an assessment of the legislative session up to that date. Uh, House, uh, Speaker of the House Melvin Neufeld thought that the session was going very well. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Anthony Hensley uh, used different words. I believe one of the words was a disaster. So uh, there was a couple articles written about this. I'd li I would like to ask the panel, uh, where do they, how do they see this 2007 session and what issues do they feel uh, have been accomplished uh, and what still needs to be done? And we'll start with Representative uh, Hubert. Thank you, Bob. Well, the budget is, you know, the, the biggest thing that we do, and I know that there has been some frustrations, but the budget process does what it does, and that's go through everything that the governor's proposed and uh, bring final decisions before us, which we will work next week. And I feel like it's doing what it needs to be done. You know, a lot of people have said that we've uh, cut taxes too much, and the reality is we don't have a taxing problem, we have a spending problem. And, and I struggle still with um, the budget going up in the state general fund by 7.7% .7 with what the government proposed. And, and I think we do have to control that desire to spend more of the taxpayer dollars, and, and that's what the budget process is all about and what we're doing. All right, Representative Sawyer. Yeah, I think it's really too early to, to make a kind of assessment on, on what the session has done yet because, you know, frankly, mostly what we've done right now so far has been done in committee. There hasn't been a lot done on the House floor. There hasn't, there's been, I think, maybe nothing that's gone all the way through the process. So I think it's way too early to make that kind of assessment. As Representative Lane pointed out, we just got through doing the budget in the Appropriations Committee. We'll debate it uh, next week on the House floor. Uh, that's a very big item. There's some other big issues hanging out there, and we'll see how we resolve them, health care, uh, the, the, the whole gaming issue. Um, so we'll see but when the session's over where we're at. But at this point, I think it's kind of a work in progress. Uh, everything's incomplete, so we don't really know where we're at yet. Representative Lane, the question is uh, the 2007 session and your assessment of it so far. Uh, thank you, Bob. Well, so far, I think we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, minor bills, uh, mostly minor things. Uh, we haven't uh, really face the big issues like the crumbling uh, universities and uh, for the regents, um, possibly of gaming out there. Uh, it may serve us later this week, uh, next week, in the, one of the House, Fed, and State committees. Uh, but overall, it's been uh, pretty mundane uh, as far as um, any active bills. Um, so it'll, it'll speed up, I'm sure, as we get closer uh, to the end. And now we're past turnaround, so I expect we're going to be dealing with all those issues we'll have to deal with before we uh, recess. All right, uh, Senator Brownlee, uh, your assessment of the uh, 2007 session? I think for the most part the session has been going well and I think it helps not to have the Supreme Court mandate hanging over our heads like we've had the last couple years on the school funding issue. That doesn't mean we don't have important issues to deal with because certainly we do. And as Representative Lane referenced, we have the deferred maintenance on our university buildings that we still need to deal with. And this is year, I hope that we will take positive steps forward on that issue. Even if we cannot commit a huge sum of money to our universities for the repair of the buildings, we can still do something. And I think it's important to mm -hmm. do that. Um, and, of course, there are a lot of other important issues to, clear, to deal with. Know. Typically, the Senate holds their budget till the end, so we haven't worked with that yet either. Nor have we dealt with uh, tax issues, and I know senator. many senators are anxious to sink their teeth into that issue. All right, let's go to the phones where we have uh, Mike from Lawrence. Mike, are you with us? Yes. Go ahead with your question, Mike. All right. Um, uh, this is in regards to the uh, Real ID Act. Um, given that the official purpose of the Real ID Act of 2005 is, among other things, any other purposes that the Secretary of Homeland Security shall, uh, shall determine, and that the Secretary of Homeland Security himself has stated 
eventually this might allow us to do double duty or triple duty uh, and have the same uh, to have the same license also be used to cross the border and be used for a whole host of other purposes. Number one, if a resolution and or bill is introduced to not comply with the Real ID Act of 2005, will you vote for it? And number two, what are you doing to help Kansas introduce this resolution and or bill to not comply with the Real ID Act of 2005? All right, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, Representative Hubert, I'll let you start. in. Representative, Representative Hubert, if you don't mind, maybe give us a little bit of background about what you know about this as well. It'd be great. Well, I know the Real ID Act's about homeland security and, and making sure we're protected during these you know, uh, times that we're in. And I think everyone agrees that that's important, but there's many that are concerned that the Real ID Act could be abused, and we've seen some things this week with the FBI and with our federal government, you know, that there are some problems and we have to be vigilant. So. Back to his question, I do agree that the state needs to, to give some feedback, and I have, I have spoken with Chairman Don Myers from Derby, who heads up the Homeland Security uh, Committee, and uh, we could look at putting together a resolution and trying to, to voice our concerns and, and try to pull back some areas where maybe the federal government's getting into some state rights issues, and, and I think that's very important for us to work with the federal government to make sure that they, that they don't do things that they don't need to do. I don't think we need a national ID card, and I think some people believe that's what we're moving towards. And so I would work to uh, do some things that will uh, allow us to protect our freedoms, but also um, send a message to the federal government that real ID needs to be changed. All right, Representative Sawyer. Yeah, I have a lot of concerns about real ID as well. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The, um, basically, you know, the federal government, you know, Li driver's licenses and ID has always been a state, a state function, and the federal government's got involved. And the way Real ID is set up right now, it would take it would, it would go into effect in May of 2008. So basically, a year from now, when people want to renew their driver's license, it'd be a very different process. And having had discussions with the driver's license bureau and stuff, they're, talk they're talking about the, right now something that takes you 10 to 20 minutes to do will take probably three times as long. So people really need to be prepared for that. Uh, first of all, it, you have to bring a lot more with you when you try to get your driver's license renewed. Uh, you're going to have to bring a verifiable, verifiable uh, social security card. You're going to have to bring um, a new birth certificate, not the old one you had that you got maybe from the hospital, but actually a recent one. So, you, so many people are going to go, have to go out and actually get a copy of their birth certificate they don't have now. They'll have to bring some other ID that shows their, where they're living at right now and prove that. So like a, a recently paid utility bill, something like that. And then you'll have to bring, of course, uh, your old driver's license. And if you don't have that, there'll be some additional ID required. So that's some of the basics of what's going to be required of individuals once Real ID takes place. Uh, some of the other concerns, though, is, is that the federal government, also from this Real ID from all these states, are building a national database. And again, that's, that's something that has a lot of concerns. It's kind of not the way we've done things in America. So, there, there's, a, so there's a lot of concerns. And, and this process, as I said, is going to take longer it's going to require states to spend a lot more money. So in Kansas alone, I think they're talking about at least an additional $30 million just for the first step of real ID that, that's going to be needed for the driver's license bureau. So you know, we've got the money involvement, you know, got issues of what it's going to involve and the hassles it's going to cause for people. So I'd like to see us slow it down. Um, I would definitely support a resolution. Let, let, you know, let's take our time on this and not rush into something and see if it's really necessary. But uh, it's not that far away. So if, if, if it doesn't get slowed down, uh, next year, when you go to renew your driver's license, it's going to be a very different process. Representative Lane in Topeka, uh, the question was about Real ID. Would you like to comment? Yes, Bob. Uh, Mike, thanks for calling in. <clears throat> uh, the Real ID Act uh, could be pose a, quite a serious problem for uh, our constituents when they go to renew their license. It's going to be uh, much more time consuming, as Representative Sawyer stated. Uh, we do. We're faced also with the problem that we don't comply. We lose possibility of losing federal monies. Um, and uh, I know that Carmen Alders over at the uh, Driver's License Bureau has been working real hard on this. They're, they're actually way ahead of the curve of some other states uh, in what we have implemented uh, over there uh, right now. And um, it will cause some problems, though, for people uh, being able to verify who they are. Um, and I believe that Congress, the federal Congress, may have we're talking about introducing a bill or may have that would repeal some of this. So um, 
I think we, it's a good idea maybe we do slow it down a little bit, uh, take a look at it, uh, see what kind of ramifications it's going to create for our constituents. All right, Senator Brownlee. I think the problem is the mandate that we're under from the federal government, and I think they need to re-examine what they have saddled the states with. And as has been stated, the complexity of trying to um, comply with this will be very difficult for the citizens. It needs another look before we move forward. All right, I've received a, a couple questions um, about something that's linked to the Id identification. That's the idea of uh, in order to register to vote, to have a birth certificate. And the question that I received was, is there a concern that this would impinge upon a voter registration in a state that is not necessarily in the top 10 for a voter turnout? And, uh, and then how do you balance uh, that need for uh, making sure that the voters are citizens with uh, possibly dampening turnout in, in elections? So we'll start with uh, Representative Sawyer on that question. Okay. Yeah, that is a major concern. If you look at just this last primary election we had right here in Wichita and across the state, it's a lot the same way. The turnout was just 12%. Uh, we do have a problem with turnout. It, it's, you know, and I f my concern is if we put too many requirements up there, it's just going to make too many hassles of our, of our citizens. It's going to uh, uh, further dampen that turnout. You know, I don't think I've been shown anywhere where there's a problem right now where we have people voting that shouldn't be. Uh, you know, throughout the history of the state of Kansas, as far as I know, we've never even prosecuted one case. So and I don't see that's a problem right now. And you have states like North Dakota. You know, North Dakota doesn't have any voter registration at all. People just show up to the polling place, sign in a vote. And again, I've never heard of any problems there. So I think we ought to work out trying to find ways to make it easier for people to vote and encourage turnout. You know, right now, if somebody registers to vote who shouldn't register to vote, it's a felony. And, uh, you know, I think having those penalties in place, maybe even increasing those penalties is the way to go. But we shouldn't hassle our regular citizens, uh, make them come up with more forms of ID and birth certificates and stuff, passports, you know, there's a bill that would, so you could show a passport to vote. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff, I think it's just going to make the turnout even worse uh, instead of, because that is a big problem in Kansas. Our turnout is, is, is going down and we need to find ways to increase turnout and not dampen it further. And we'll go to Topeka, but before we do, uh, Minnesota, I believe, also has same-day registration, but th they elected a governor uh, who was a Jesse Ventura, so I don't know if that's an argument for or against. People can decide about that. But let's go to Topeka on this question of, a, uh, for, in order to register to vote, having a, a passport or a birth certificate. Let's start with Senator Brownlee. Thank you. I don't believe that asking someone to show a government-issued ID is going to be that prohibitive to keep someone from voting. I think it helps verify that we do have a secure voting system. So I think it's wise to go down this road, but we do need to encourage our citizens to vote. And it's very perplexing to me that Kansans are not taking this responsibility seriously. So certainly we need to encourage people to vote, but I don't believe that asking for a picture ID is what's preventing people from voting at this point, nor will it in the future. Uh, the numbers would be very, very small. All right, uh, Re Representative Lane, still in Topeka. Yes, Bob. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, to me, it's so important that we have uh, large involvement in every election, um, impeding people from the process, causing them problems if they go to the polls and they don't have the proper ID. Um, it's going to cause them lots of problems. It'll disenfranchise voters. And uh, a passport, I believe, is around $84 or in that range, and a uh, birth certificate costs $14. And uh, to require that of uh, some of our citizens, especially some of the folks in my district, I think it's almost similar to a poll tax. I spent all afternoon today out in my district uh, going door to door registering voters because of such a low turnout in the last primary cycle for the local elections. I think it's important we get people involved, and I've decided to get out and uh, kind of work my area and try to get some people uh, signed up to vote and involved in the process. So I think we should do all we can to encourage people to partake in every election and not impede them. Thank you, Representative Blaine. And the person that asked me to ask the question uh, noted that they are involved in voter registration drives uh, out in the communities and uh, in classrooms and said that they, they knew that the people, when they do that, would not have uh, their birth certificates with them, which is why they were concerned. But we'll go to Representative Hubert on this question. Well, 
I agree with Representative Brownlee that it's just not asking too much to show a, a photo ID. A driver's license required to, to cash a check, and we want safe, secure uh, voting procedures so that you know people know that their vote counts and that, that we have a, a good voting process. And so it's just not asking too much, and I don't think we're going to disenfranchise people. Um, I think it's just real important that we do encourage people to be involved in the process, and there's, there's better ways to deal with the apathy that's in our society uh, than, than trying to, to say that we don't need to require an ID. Um, you know, it's just not that big of a problem, and I think most people would agree that it's a good idea. All right, uh, received a couple email questions on uh, what may be considered a big topic, and I'm sure the uh, representatives will be anxious to talk about it, which is expanded uh, gaming or, and gambling. And uh, I put together a number of, of questions about this, and so we'll form this question to be to the, our panelists. Do you support expanded gamely, gaming in Kansas, and especially uh, in what form and how do you see it going about if you do support it and where the money w would go? And we'll, s we'll actually start this time in Topeka, because we've been starting in Wichita, and we'll go to uh, Representative Harold Lane. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for that email question on uh, expanded gaming. Uh, right now, you know, we have gaming in Kansas. Uh, we have the social ills that go with gaming, but we're not reaping the benefits. We're not uh, capturing those dollars. Uh, a lot of money in southeast Kansas is going into Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of money in northeast Kansas is going into Missouri. Uh, also, we have the uh, racing industry that's suffering right now. Uh, with some slots expanded into those that might keep them uh, uh, alive and well. Right now, they're not doing well. Uh, and we need to be very careful of how much we expand it and how it's done and where the revenue source would go. I think that's the most important thing is we uh, dictate that the revenue goes to only certain areas and stay within those parameters. I know we can't really restrict future legislators from making changes, but I think that... Uh, we need to be careful that it's a few large destination areas uh, where we can get someone that will come in that will invest 350 to $500 million in construction. Uh, we'd see a two- to three-year uh, construction cycle with lots of jobs uh, for building the casinos. And then we would have that revenue that's now currently going over to our border states, staying within our state. All right, we'll go to Representative Hubert here in Wichita. Thank you, Bob. Fed and State Affairs has started having some hearings on, on gaming issues. We started Friday and we're going to be having hearings again Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for sure. So this is a good chance for people to uh, contact their legislators and let them know where you stand. Um, I really believe that gambling is not an economic development issue unless you're bringing in people from out of the state. I understand the issue with Wyandotte dealing with the, the riverboats and we have other parts of the state that are dealing with Indian casinos down in Oklahoma. And so I can understand that we could look at some things that, um, that might involve those areas just because of the revenue that is being lost. But speaking about revenue, a lot of people talk about gambling bringing in money for the state. And, you know, we do have gaming already in this state. And I think that uh, uh, the governor and the, the Indian tribes, if we look at trying to uh, renegotiate those compacts, we could look at with existing gaming trying to get money from existing gaming. And I think that's a good place to start also. Senator Brownlee, the question is about uh, expan possibly expanding gaming in Kansas. Yes, this is a proverbial issue. It comes up every year just as the sun rises every morning. Uh, we face it every year. And I would agree with Representative Hubert that it's not an economic development tool. And in fact, the problem is, is that there is so much gaming available in our country, it's no longer a destination venue. Uh, it used to be that people would go to Nevada or they would go to New Jersey for gaming. Now it's so widespread that what happens is it's the people close to home that spend their money on the increased gambling opportunities if we were to go this route. What I mean by that is they tend to just replace their current spending with spending in a casino. That doesn't grow the economy. That doesn't help uh, us provide greater revenues. Sure, we would collect more, possibly, from a casino, but it would also hurt the existing businesses. So we want to grow our economy with those things that won't hurt existing business, but that would help everyone grow. All right, let's go to Representative Tom Sawyer here in Wichita. Okay. 
One of the problems we have with, with gaming right now, one of the reasons it's a big issue in Kansas is because there is so much gaming going on right now in Kansas, and the state of Kansas doesn't benefit one bit from it. Uh, you've got the area in the Wyandotte County area, the, the Kansas City, Kansas area, where right across the river in Missouri, they've got river boats, and every day, thousands of Kansans are over there spending money that's going to Missouri instead of Kansas. And down in southeast Kansas, they have a problem with several casinos now in northeast Oklahoma. There's one casino that's being built that the parking lot is actually in Kansas. Casinos in Oklahoma, parking lots in Kansas. So it's an issue we have to deal with in terms of um, the economics and that, that Kansas money is leaving our state all the time. Here in the Wichita area, there's now, in northern Oklahoma, closer to us, we now have casinos being built. So it's an issue we have to deal with. Kansans are, are gambling. The question we have to deal with as a legislature is, you know, how can we best deal with that and keep Kansas money uh, in, in Kansas. Uh, one, of the, one of the other parts of the question was, you know, how should that money be spent? And one of the things that there has to be in all the bills is some of that money has to go for problem gaming because there are people, you know, most people don't have a problem with gambling. They go down, they have fun, they, they spend a little bit of money, but there are some people who do get addicted. There are some people who do have gambling problems and we have to deal with it. One of the shortfalls with the lottery, you know, we have $200 million now that Kansans spend on the lottery. You know, it's a state-run, state-operated operation, the lottery. The lottery spends $4 million a year, in fact, in advertising, encouraging people to buy lottery tickets. And, but, but, the, but the lottery only spends $88,000 a year dealing with problem gaming. And I think that's one area that's a big shortfall for our state right now, and that if we do pass any kind of type of expanded gaming, we have to make sure that some of that money goes to deal with the people that do have a problem uh, with, the, the, with gaming addiction. All right, this is a big issue. I think uh, deserves some attention. Uh, Representative Hubert uh, had a follow-up he wanted to talk about. One of the things that came up in our hearings, even on Friday, was just concerns with how we op operate gambling. And I know a lot of people have said, you know, with our current constitution that we don't want state-owned and operated casinos. And so we can look at maybe a constitutional amendment that allow people to vote on it, changing our constitution. That way, if we do approach gaming in the future, I think it gives us a better way to do it. And even right now at the Woodlands, one of the things we heard was some real problems with some um, things that were happening. And, and there's some investigations going on where the Attorney General's office was working with the Security the Racing Security Commission. And, and there's some real issues that need to be resolved and looked at and monitored with gaming because there, uh, there's just a lot of problems associated with gambling outside of just problem gamers. All right. Yeah, and a follow-up from Representative Sawyer. Yeah, I, I would also like to add that whatever we do with gaming, for me personally, I think it needs to be voted on by the, by the public you know, b before we go forward. Uh, we, and we shouldn't put gaming in any, any area where people haven't voted to support it. Um, you know, I, I think that's an important piece. Rep Representative Hubert mentioned the possibility of a constitutional amendment, regardless of which approach we take, whether it's a constitutional amendment or it's a state-owned and operated approach. Either way, I think there should be a vote of the people first. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to the phones and we go to Teresa from Newton. Teresa, are you with us? Yes, I am. Go ahead with your question, Teresa. Um, recently, I've been to the hygienist school at WSU and it's a great program. And I had the opportunity to talk to a dentist there. And he, like I did, thought everyone should be within 200 miles of a dental school. And they have the hygienist school set up there. So it wouldn't be like that you were would be out a whole lot of money. And uh, this eventually, with co-pays, would hopefully pay for itself. And in the long run, you would be making money in, with new tuition coming into your programs. And it would not only benefit disabled people, but it would uh, help the working people and who are and also the poor indigenous people. Um, who can't afford to get regular dental care. And uh, it, everybody seems to be overlooking their, den their students here wanting to be dentists. And is there anything I can do personally that um, to look up uh, information, feasibility study, anything like that I would be glad to do with my time. And they have also, just as a sidebar, they have found that plaque on the teeth is also what forms plaque in the arteries. They haven't figured it out uh, scientifically how that happens, but it so is it, a fact, it, and it also is a is right. something that um, concerns strokes and diabetes. Okay, well, we have to cut. So, we'll have to uh, cut you off. Uh, is your question okay. asking for more uh, dental 
dental schools? I would like a dental school oh. in WSU. All right, thank you. Uh, well, we have legislators from the Wichita area. Representative Hubert? There has been discussion over the last several years about that issue, and I think South Central Delegation is trying to push that. Um, uh, we, we have some agreements with other states, including Missouri right now, where uh, some of the people who are wanting to go to dental school have cooperative agreements with Missouri, just like when they want to come over and go to veterinary school, they can come to K-State. But uh, I think that there is plenty of room for us to move forward with trying to move towards having a, a dental school at Wichita State, and uh, we need to continue to push that idea. All right, well, let's uh, get back to the email questions. I actually have two emails on this. So let me uh, put them together. One is from uh, Mike, and the other is from uh, Abby in Topeka. And uh, I'll read one. Uh, would the legislators be willing to, to, uh, to look again at the smoking ban bill? Uh, would you be interested in seeing this bill next session, as is my understanding it is to di died in committee this session? If you're not interested in criminalizing smoking in public, would you consider other options to ensure clean air and restaurants for the general public? That was from... Mike, so it, it pertains to the smoking ban bill, and then Abby from Topeka sent in an email uh, referencing the obscenity bill in which uh, she said that if, if, if legislators are interested in protecting children from obscenity and the bill would uh, take away the protection of teachers regarding obscenity, then why aren't they willing to uh, make it criminal to smoke in a car or enclosed space wh with children present, which obviously would have physical ramifications. So we, we almost have two questions here, and so I'll, I'll throw it out to the legislators, and we'll start with Representative Sawyer. Yeah, actually, the smoking ban bill is a Senate bill, so I'm, I actually, Senator Bromley should probably address it, and I don't know where it's at. I assume the person following the issue knows better that, is, that, it's, that it's dead for the session, although I've learned over time that nothing really dies in the legislature until we go home. There's always a chance to, to resurrect bills, but I think it's something that we need to discuss Obviously, smoking's a problem, and we need to encourage people to smoke less. Secondhand smoke's a problem for kids in particular, and, and particularly when we have children involved, to keep, keep the smoke away from kids is very important. But uh, I'd certainly take a look at any bill that would come over, but that, as my understanding is that bill started in the Senate and it hasn't come to the House yet. So. Okay, well, let's go to Senator Brownlee in Topeka uh, about the smoking ban bill, and there was a, another email that referenced the obscenity bill. Whatever you'd like to talk about, Senator Brownlee. Okay. The smoking ban bill was in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the Senate leadership has chosen not to take a vote on that. It did get heavily amended in committee, and some of those amendments allowed for local options uh, to where the local government could make those decisions. Personally, I think that's a good option. I live in Olathe, where our, our city government, our city council, has chosen to ban smoking in restaurants. and. There's one particular place our family enjoys um, much, much more now without the smoke. I think it works better on a local level. And I think as we take steps like that, it does communicate strongly the message to parents uh, that they do need to protect their children from secondhand smoke. I would um, be hesitant to criminalize a parent uh, exposing their child to secondhand smoke. I don't think that's an appropriate step but let's continue to educate in that direction. The obscenity bill was in the House, and the issue there is that currently um, K through 12 is exempt from following state obscenity laws, and the bill would have indicated that uh, the obscenity laws would also apply to K through 12. That was how it came out of the federal, and I believe, I'm not sure which House committee, maybe judiciary. Uh, or Fed and State Affairs. Nonetheless, I believe it was, again, heavily amended on the House floor. I do think there's room for us to consider that legislation. It doesn't make sense that we would have an obscenity law, but yet say uh, that our schools, our K-12 through schools, would not be subject to that. All right, thank you. We'll go to Representative Hubert. And, and uh, I'm not going to apologize for mixing the, uh, the two questions because that's what the emailer uh, asked about, but I think it's an interesting um, juxtaposition. We'll go to Representative Hubert. Uh, again, the smoking bill has been in the Senate, so I don't know a lot about that, but Fed and State Affairs did hear the obscenity uh, bill and took it to the House floor. It was amended to include uh, the regents and the, the higher education, and there was a lot of concern about that, so the bill was sent back to the Education Committee where it is currently dead. And like Tom said, there's nothing truly dead in the legislature until the, uh, 
the session's over. So, you know, I agree with what Karen Brownlee said there in regards to, um, you know, our obscenity laws and that they should apply to everyone and that our, we should err on the side of our children with protecting our children and that's what the bill is trying to do. It wasn't about banning books, which some people tried to imply that it was, so. Representative Lane, uh, both the obscenity bill and uh, the smoking ban will throw at you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, as far as the statewide smoking ban, I think it's best we leave it to the local governments, the local control. Uh, let the local units of government decide that they would like to ban smoking in their communities. Uh, bring that forward and uh, let the people voice those concerns to their uh, city council people or their county commissioners. Uh, and as far as the uh, ban uh, through on K through 12 on obscenity in schools, I think that. Uh, we need to also allow the local school boards to uh, have that decision. They're elected close to the people and they can decide uh, what books or periodicals are available in the school libraries uh, for those students. And uh, as far as parents smoking in a car with a child, I would uh, be hesitant to pass any law or vote in favor of one that would make that a criminal act at this time. I think it's important that uh, we keep educating people the harm harmful effects of cigarette smoke and secondhand smoke, and uh, we need to keep continuing in that education process. Uh, I, I myself have vivid memories of grandma smoking in the car and uh, me barely making it through the trip. Okay, let's go, uh, let's go back to the phone. We have uh, Edward in um, Newton, Kansas. Edward, are you with us? That's correct. Go ahead, Edward. Okay, I, I'd like to have two quick questions here. Uh, what do the legislatures feel about requiring a two-thirds supermajority to create any new tax or raise any existing tax? And this would be, of course, a constitutional amendment to require the two-thirds supermajority. The other question is, how do they feel about the franchise tax? Should we eliminate it? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Let's start with uh, Representative Hubert here in Wichita. Two really good questions, and uh, the franchise tax has went through the House and is uh, still sitting over in the Senate. And, and I believe that you know it is one of those taxes that's almost getting into triple taxation on our businesses, and I do believe we need to eliminate it. We in the House phased it out over a three-year period, and, and that's about $15 million per year that would be uh, saved for businesses, and, and I think that's a reasonable approach. Uh, in regards to the two-thirds majority with a constitutional amendment or something like that, I do support that. There's been a lot of talk about Tabor-like bills that you know would cause problems for our state government. And, and again, I go back to my opening remarks that we do have a spending problem in this state. We don't know how to say no. There's so many things that you know are good that we want to spend money for, but we have to control our spending. And uh, there's a group in the legislature right now on the House side that are trying to even voluntarily without a uh, a constitution amendment to, to set aside some spending limits that would uh, keep the state general fund to probably the $5.7 billion mark. And, and that's going to take cutting out some of what the governor's put in right now. And uh, we have to be willing as legislators to say no to spending. And, and many times in state government, it, we, we're just not very good at that because there's too many things that people want to spend money on. And so I would support what you said but getting there is a, a very tough challenge to get to a, a two-thirds vote and making a constitutional amendment. It's not going to happen this session. It's not even on the table. So you're going to have to ask your legislators to step up the plate and say no to spending because right now we're looking at growing state government by 7.7%, and that's too much. All right, Representative Lane, uh, the, the caller had a uh, two-part question. Uh, your answer on those two parts? Well, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Edward, for your call. Uh, as far as the uh, constitutional amendment uh, to require a two-thirds majority vote uh, for a tax increase, um, I had some research done last year when this idea kind of surfaced, and uh, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was like the last 16 years, any tax increases, uh, the majority of them already passed by over a two-thirds vote uh, supermajority. So I think most of the time we have that large participation, and we're really going to take that huge step and uh, pass a tax that nobody, none of us like to do. Uh, I think that uh, history will show that it had over a two-thirds vote most of the times. Uh, and as far as the franchise tax uh, repeal, uh, the House passed that out. It's about a $45 million loss in revenue over the next three years. 
uh, but hopefully the Senate will take a look at that and uh, see if that's something that uh, the state can afford at this time. Um, we have to be careful. Uh, I know in our House budget we increased it oh, approximately 190 to 200 million Friday in committee uh, before it was passed out to the floor in uh, new spending. So uh, I think that we'll have to, when we get to the end here in conference uh, committees, we'll have to take a close look at uh, all the tax reductions that have been passed through already and uh, new spending that we need to do. All right, uh, Representative Sawyer. Uh, th again, I'd like to thank you for the question. Uh, on the franchise tax, I do agree that we need to, to begin phasing it out. The governor had a proposal to cut the franchise tax. Uh, the House passed, uh, I think, maybe a little different version to phase it out over three years. But I think it is something we ought to look at because uh, for, for voters who under, understand what the franchise tax is, it's a, it's a tax on corporations for filing their papers. It, that's where the word franchise comes in with, with the Secretary of State's office. They, they file those papers and they pay a tax. Uh, the proposal that, we, that the House has would basically replace it with a franchise fee because right now you pay a franchise fee and then you pay a tax on top of it. The fee would still be in place to cover the actual cost for the government uh, to file the, for the Secretary of State's office to file those papers and, and, and their actual costs, which makes sense. But the tax on top of it uh, re really doesn't make sense and it's something that as we can afford to do it, we ought to be able to, uh, to phase that out. Uh, Representative Lane kind of stole some of my thunder in terms of when you look at the, the, at least the history in the last 20 years or so, of uh, tax increases that, that they've generally been very, when we have passed tax increases, it's generally been by very large majorities and bipartisan majorities, so we haven't had a problem uh, meeting the two-thirds. Uh, in terms of sp spending in general, it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, at the time I've been in the legislature, there's only been one time that the legislature didn't add a significant amount of money to the governor's budget. It's, it doesn't, doesn't matter if the governor's a Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter if the legislature's controlled by Democrats or Republicans, although it's generally all but two years was controlled by Republicans. I mean, but it doesn't matter, it's not really a party thing, it's just that the legislative process, the way it works, and I think it's because there's 165 of us, 125 in the House, 40 in the Senate, that in the end, we always end up spending more than the governor's original recommendation. So it seems like if we really wanna cut spending, if we just pass, it doesn't matter what, who the governor is, just pass the governor's budget the first day and went home, uh, we would save some spending. All right, Senator Brownlee and Topeka. Yes, I think we do need to move forward in reducing the franchise tax and do that over time. I believe the Senate's passed a bill out of the tax committee. We have not yet seen that on the floor, but I think that's an important step in the right direction and should help grow our businesses in the state if we would reduce that over time to the point that we eventually eliminated it. As far as the question on should we require a two-thirds majority vote, a supermajority, so to speak, on raising taxes of any kind, there has not been much of an appetite for that. Unfortunately, we are big spenders in Kansas, and we do need to do something to decrease our appetite for spending. We have gotten ourselves into a situation where Kansas is considered a fairly high-tax state, and that in and of itself, I think, discourages um, new businesses from coming and probably new businesses from emerging within our state. So we need to address the issue of taxes because we have raised them too far. All right, thank you. I've received an email from Mary uh, that I'm going to save for the end of the program because uh, Mary asked uh, the legislators to talk about one issue that it hasn't been talked about in the program. So we'll save that for the end, maybe the last uh, minute and a half for each legislator to talk about an issue that they think needs to be addressed in the legislature. In the meantime, let's go back to the uh, phones and we have uh, Irene from Wichita. Irene, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Irene. Um, if there is a separation of church and state, why do we vote at the church as well as using the Bible to be sworn in? Thank you. Okay. Uh, interesting question. Would anybody like to uh, tackle that one? I think uh, she gives some specific examples, but it's more of almost a philosophical question. Representative Sawyer? Yeah, I mean, the... The polling places, you know, it's up to each election officer. In, in, in 101 counties, it's the, lo the local elected county clerk. In the big four counties, including here in Wichita, it's an appointed election commissioner by the Secretary of State. And it's up to them to find polling places that are convenient for people and that they can get for free. And so quite often you'll see they will use churches because they can get those for free. Uh, they will use schools sometimes, but part of the problem with using schools is that, you know, our elections are on Tuesdays and in the daytime, so the schools are being used, so it's not as convenient where churches are, you know, their busy times on Sundays, 
um, they're not really being used on a Tuesday. They're kind of available all day, and so that's kind of, I think, uh, where that comes from. Um, the uh, second issue in terms of being sworn on a Bible, you, you actually have a choice. You don't have to be sworn in with a Bible. Uh, most of the time you just raise your right hand, and uh, when you're being sworn in in government or, or anything, you, you have the choice. You don't have to be sworn in with the Bible. So I hope that addresses her specific concerns, but, you know, um, it, I don't, I have not really heard that, that for example, that voting in polling, place, polling places in churches has become a problem, um, but they are free and easy uh, access for, for most voters. All right, uh, I, I was uh, received an email from Mark, who uh, we're still on the subject of voting, who asked uh, the panel to address whether they would support moving a Kansas uh, presidential primary up to uh, February of 2008 and then uh, funding this, and we'll, we'll just, uh, We'll question the panel on this. We'll start uh, in Topeka with Representative uh, Harold Lane. Thank you, uh, Bob and Mark, for that question. Uh, actually, in the uh, subcommittee of appropriations that I'm on, uh, we do the uh, Secretary of State's budget. And uh, when we worked that uh, budget in committee, uh, we actually uh, did include $2 million for uh, the presidential primary, and we set a date as February 5th. Uh, we thought that would be early enough that we would get the most bang for our dollar, uh, where we'd be out there uh, in the lead uh, before uh, the decision is over with. Um, I think if we're going to spend $2 million, it needs to be early enough uh, in, in, in the date of the calendar where, where it can make a difference. Uh, but I, I also believe Kansans deserve uh, the right to vote in the presidential primary if, if they so wish. Uh, I know there's a lot of other uses for $2 million. Uh, that we could use in the budget for other programs. But um, I know that uh, this is kind of an important issue. Uh, we haven't had that for quite a few years. And um, if it was a real uh, early enough date, I would support it. If it gets back towards the end of February, I, I don't see us the need for spending the $2 million. All right, thank you. The questioner did ask each panelist, so we'll do that. Will uh, Representative Hubert? Uh, I agree with Representative Lane that if we're going to do it, we need to have it as early in the process as, as uh, possible. And I think by February 5th, both parties are going to have their nominations uh, locked down. So uh, some people are concerned that there's going to be so many primaries on that February 5th day that we get lost in the mix. But we can't do any later than that. But uh, given that opportunity, I, I, I would support that and allow people to vote. Senator Brownlee? I would tend to agree with the things that have been stated. I think the issue here is we want Kansas to be put on the map when it comes to selecting the candidates for the presidency. States such as Iowa and New Hampshire gain quite a bit of attention and notoriety because of their involvement early on in the presidential candidate selection. And I think we want to be a part of that and not be left out. Unfortunately, it does come with a price tag, but hopefully it would be a very positive thing for our state. All right, Representative Sawyer? Yeah, I pretty much agree with what's been said so far. Uh, the problem we have is both national party rules. You know, they, they're the ones that govern uh, the selection process for president. And both parties have basically said that if you have a primary or caucus before February 5th, then it doesn't count. The, the, your delegates won't be seated at the national conventions. Those votes won't count. So the soonest you can have it is February 5th because they want New Hampshire and Iowa to stay for, be the first two states, both parties. So what that's caused is many states now have said, all right, we're going to have our primaries February 5th. You know, California, all these big states, a number of states have said we're going February 5th. So the problem we have for Kansas is if we don't also get it on the February 5th date, then anything after that may be too late. And uh, which is kind of kind of scary that our presidential <coughs> process would be finished that fast. But you know, two million dollars is, as Representative Lane points out, is a lot of money. And uh, the last time we had a primary was 1992. It cost us 1.2 million. Um, you know, if we're going to spend that kind of money, we need to be relevant. And make sure that it's not wasted. You know, our, the primary we had in 92 was April 1st. Well, April 1st by then certainly everything would be done, and, would, and, and I would see that as a waste of two million dollars. So we need to make sure if we're going to do it. Uh, let's try to get on that February 5th date or very close to it. All right, let's go back to the phones. Uh, Judy from Preston. Judy, are you with us? Yes, I am. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, talking about the franchise tax on the utilities, my husband was mayor of a small town, and the population here is about 180 people. Our real estate taxes are very low. 
and what we uh, what really runs and helps us operate our city is we do pay uh, taxes on our utilities, and then we get uh, uh, a check from the state mm -hmm. to reimburse. You know, sure. On the utilities, you understand what I'm saying? Right, so you're worried about the impact of that legislation on the small towns. I am towns. very worried about it because this is a very small town. Right. Well, let's get right to the legislators on that. Uh, impact, uh, Representative Hubert? Well, the franchi franchise fees, besides just utilities, there's a lot of different things like cable and uh, telephones and other things that we look at. and so. Um, we, we don't want to uh, cause problems for the small communities in regards to revenues that they are they're getting, but we also don't want to cause problems as far as access to services. We want competition and uh, we want to be able to keep costs down for the, the end users, you know, the people that we represent. So there's a balance though that we have to have. All right, we have about uh, five minutes left and, and we can add things, but uh, we did have Mary who asked uh, to talk about something that hasn't been talked about. We have about a minute and 10 seconds, uh, so we'll go to each legislator. And if you want to talk about the franchise tax during that uh, time, you can. We'll start with Representative uh, Harold Lane in Topeka. And what was Mary's question, Bob? Well, Mar uh, Mary, was, uh, Mary wanted to know if there was an issue that uh, we haven't talked about in this hour that you'd really like to see addressed this legislative session. Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, Mary, that question. And. Uh, like I say, I think one thing that hasn't been addressed is the uh, crumbling classrooms for the regents. I think that's uh, an important issue that we have to look at and step up to the plate and uh, start uh, funding some money. It's probably not going to be able to be done in one year. It's, it's such a huge amount. Uh, we probably also need to kind of prioritize those uh, items that have been presented to us by the regents and the universities and uh, try to prioritize which ones need to be done immediately and uh, um, take a look at that. Uh, we haven't done that yet, and I think that's something we need to do. Uh, and, and now that we, uh, as Senator Brownlee said earlier, we don't have the uh, K through 12 school funding issue in front of us right now. So I think that's an important issue we need to take a look at. And, and as far as the franchise fees, uh, that's, that's a big part of all uh, local units of government's uh, budget. Uh, I know when I served on the city council, we were negotiating new contracts with different uh, providers such as cable or telephone uh, utilities and on, on how much they were going to pay and, and the revenue that, the, that we uh, get to operate our local units of government on. So uh, that's something we have to be very careful of when we look at franchise fees and franchise taxes. All right. Thank you very much. We have a minute each. We'll go to Representative Sawyer. Uh, the, probably the issue I'm going to talk about is paying the debt off. You know, when we had good times in the, the mid-90s, Unfortunately, the legislature, the governor, went on a spending spree, and at that, that time, I said, look, when we're in the good times, we need to t take advantage of it, pay our, pay our debts off at that time, so when the bad times do come, we don't have to raise taxes or cut programs. We didn't do that in the mid-90s. Late 90s come, early 2000s, when we were in a budget crisis, the legislature raised fees, raised taxes. So hopefully this time we've learned from that. As, we, as we're going into good times again, our revenues are up, let's make sure we take, first thing we do is pay our debts off during these good times again. Uh, keep our spending under control so we don't have to raise taxes or cut programs in the future. Thank you. Senator Brownlee, one minute on the issue, an issue that we haven't talked about uh, in this program. Okay. On the franchise fees, uh, that's pretty much a local issue. I would encourage uh, Judy to please uh, be sure to have a good conversation with her local government because they primarily utilize that money and make the decisions on that. And as far as an issue that we haven't yet discussed, um, like I said early on in the program, in the Senate we haven't discussed tax policy and we have proposals to reduce the uh, tax on Social Security income, for example, on seniors. We also have a proposal to re um, help the seniors not continue to face the increases in their property taxes as appraised values go up. I think we need to address those issues and be sure that we are providing appropriate tax relief for Kansans because as we allow Kansans to have that money in their own pocket, they spend it, they fuel our economy. And I think we need to move forward on some of these pro these really positive proposals that we have before us. All right. Thank you very, mu very much. Representative Hubert, one minute. 
Healthcare is a, something we haven't talked about today, and, and, uh, and we need to talk about it. Uh, uh, I don't want to move towards universal health care, but I do want to look at how can we make uh, private commercial health care more affordable. And there are Section 125 plans that aren't being utilized that we can encourage and, and help uh, small businesses with. Uh, we need to reform Medicaid. We don't need to be moving more people onto Medicaid. Uh, we need to be moving more people into private uh, health care plans. Uh, we need to strengthen the um, uh, safety nets that we have out there that work with the uninsured and make sure that they have the services that they need. And I think we're doing some things to be able to do that. But the House uh, Republicans put out a plan that I think that there's some common things with what some Democrats have suggested, and I think we can find common ground to at least get started this year with improving health care in the state, because that's a big issue. All right. That's all the time we have for this Sunday's edition of Ask Your Legislature. I'd like to thank Senator Karen Brownlee and Representative Harold Lane for joining us in the Topeka studio, and Representative Steve Hubert and Tom Sawyer for being with us here in Wichita. Also, a special thank you to all the viewers in Cherokee County who watch the program. Another reminder that on March 25th, we'll have members of Congress Nancy Boyda and Todd Tehart for a special edition of the show. And you can email us questions beforehand for that show. But thanks for watching. That's all the time we have. We'll see you next time. Production of